All right, so welcome to Night Hacking Interviews at the Javaland Conference. I'm joined by Peter Lowry. And last time I saw you, we were on a sunny beach and on the island of Crete. That was very nice. And now we're, now we're in an amusement park in Germany, so I think we're, we're setting a good record of being in interesting places for, for our chats. That's what I like. And I heard you did an interesting talk yesterday on, on legacy Lambda code in Java. Yes. So the talk we did yesterday was about um, a project that we'd worked on uh, migrating C-sharp code, which had a lot of um, Lambda code in it that from about three years ago. And um, it had uh, developed over time. So um, even though we translated it into Java, we got to see some of the things that you may end up doing in Java um, once your application has been around for a few years and a few developers have touched the application, you start to see some real-world use cases. So for, does it um, have any interesting um, code smells? Yes. Um, also, we saw some, some interesting um, uh, differences between the way C Sharp does things and the way Java does things, um, which, of course, uh, triggered some sort of subtle bugs. But, um, yeah, so, so to start with, we had... Um, we, we, we could see that one of the problems that you get is that um, with a stream, um, what you want to do is, is have the stream run as long as possible before you collect on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the common problems was actually collecting prematurely uh, into, say, a list, and then taking that list and turning it back into a stream again, and then doing some more stream operations, and then okay. turning it back so into that, collection. So that produces quite a lot of extra garbage objects in the intermediate, short-lived objects. That's right. You get extra garbage. It's just extra work. And it's also um, more complexity because, in fact, all you, if you, you've got more code in there that just doesn't, doesn't do you any good. Um, uh, on the um, C Sharp to Java translation side, uh, what we saw was that um, one of the big differences is that uh, dictionary in C Sharp um, is uh, stable in terms of the order you add keys. Okay. So we had some code where it would first it, sort... It depended upon the stability yeah. of the ordering. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we had first it would sort by the key and then group by that key. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that works in C Sharp because the sorting order is preserved when it does the group by, uh, whereas in Java it puts it into a hash map, so the ordering is not preserved. And so uh, you end up losing that. Um, so it looks like it's doing the right thing. You're doing a sort, then you're doing a group by. But in reality, that sort is effectively being discarded. Um, so just switching the order of operations fixes that group, then sort, or is it more complicated? Well, um, to do a literal translation, you would use a linked hash map. So you can tell it to use a linked hash map okay. instead of a hash map. So that preserves the, the order in which you added. But a more elegant solution is just to add it to a sorted collection in the first place, and um, we ended up using a tree map with an appropriate comparator. Okay. Well, the comparator being sort by key. Um, uh, another, another one we saw as a, as a sort of common pattern, particularly migrating to Java, was that um, uh, use of optionals were being avoided. So one, one common pattern we were seeing was that anything that returned an optional would then call dot um, or else null, which effectively drops back to the old pattern of having a, a reference which may or may not be null. Mm -hmm. And then you check to see whether that was null or not. <laughs> so, so you kind of like, you almost had it, but then you went back to the old ways. So, um, so we, that, that was taking, that took a bit, of, a bit of extra work to make sure that optional was used the way it was intended. Okay. Um, and um, and so we got we got some interesting effects there. And another thing that we did after we got it into production, um, we looked at some other uses for streams and optionals that we hadn't really considered before. So one, one example is a, a way of building up equals method is to start with an optional. So you have an optional um, of, and then you have the your the thing you're comparing the equals to. Then you filter, you say that it must be the same instance, then you map it to that type, and then you filter on each of the fields, and finally you just say is present, and, and as a result, you end up building an equals comparison um, based on optional. So mm. it's an interesting way to create one liner that allows you to, to build an equals method. 
for. Um, that's another thing we did. Uh, uh, yes, and, and, and a big topic yesterday and, and subject to quite a few questions is the use of parallel stream. Yeah. Now, um, what happens in a lot of applications is people overuse uh, multi-threadedness. They figure that, oh, well, if you make it multi-threaded, it must, must be better. Get, must be better, <laughs> must be faster. Um, but it's one of these things that it's, it's a shared resource. So the more you do it, the less benefit you get. So if one, one little part of your application uses all the CPUs, that's fine. But if all of your components try to use all the CPUs, they actually just get in each other's way and you end up with an application that's less stable performance-wise. Well, I think it can actually be worse than that because you're using the same um, using the same pool, and <coughs> if and you have any one which is blocking on the parallel stream, then you've actually reduced your CPU throughput because you now have CPUs waiting for things to happen. Yes, you certainly don't want to be doing any blocking operations on your um, your parallel stream pool. Um, but the, the, the main benefit that I saw in terms of how to use it in a sensible manner is that you, you implement it using just plain stream, mm -hmm. you benchmark your application for a realistic test, and then you um, switch it to parallel stream and see whether it helps or not. And so in our case, what happened was that we had, um, we had 25,000 lines of code. In reality, only about 10% of that code used streams in a functional way. Mm -hmm. Everything else was actually quite imperative. Cool. Um, and uh, so that's still about um, two and a half thousand lines. But uh, when it came to trying out, putting in parallel stream, take it out, see which what actually helps, we found that adding parallel stream in just four places was enough to use all the CPU of the box. So in fact, in reality, we only used it in four places. Uh, and, and the nicest thing about it is not, um, see for me, often I think about not how easy it is easy to add something, how easy it to is it to it take it away. away. And in particular, um, with parallel stream, um, uh, normally if you're writing parallel code, there's quite an investment in actually rewriting Yeah, no, no, if you code. had ported everything to fork join, then yes. the amount of work it would take to then pull it back to be a sequential algorithm would be enough that you just simply wouldn't do it. Exactly, and so you end up with all these situations where people have left it in when they really shouldn't have. Yeah. So the nice thing about Parallel Stream is you can not only switch it in, you can switch it out very quickly without too much uh, personal investment in it. And so you can make the right, more likely to make the right decisions as to where it actually really helps. And, and that's the way you deploy the application. Cool. All right. I think you picked up some tips from Kirk about um, measure, <laughs> code measurement. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and Kirk's also got some um, fairly strong views on, uh, on uh, parallel stream. And I, I, think, um, I think to some degree that he's right. He, I think he's concerned that it will be overused, and it probably will be. Yeah. But um, fortunately, at least, it's, it's quite easy to pull out. Cool. Okay, any other takeaways, or were those the major ones? Uh, I think they were the major ones. Um, the, the, the biggest, probably the biggest takeaway is that, uh, for me, is that um, for a long time, functional programming languages have been around a long time, and they really haven't had a lot of adoption in, um, uh, in business applications. And that's because writing pure functional um, applications no side effects is actually really hard in a business yeah. use case. Yeah. And so um, you shouldn't expect necessarily to migrate all your code to functional programming. However, there are portions of the code, in our case it turned out to be only about 10%, 10%, where it really made a lot of sense. It really made the code a lot nicer, a lot more concise, uh, a lot more elegant, and in some cases more performant. Um, so. Uh, it, it really does help if you use it in combination with the programming styles that you're going to be, you're already familiar with, uh, rather than as a complete replacement. Um, so I think that's, that's, that was the main point that I was trying to get across in this talk. Okay, no, so I think that's excellent advice for people adopting some of the new functional programming features in Java 8. Um, and any pointers you want to give folks for where you'll be next or how to reach out to you if they want to have questions? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, the easiest way to ask questions is actually via Stack Overflow. I'm, I'm on there quite regularly. <laughs> I've got um, now more answers than anyone else in Java <laughs> and JVM. All um, right, very nice. You're the king of Stack Overflow. <laughs> well, certainly for Java anyway. I, I take some comfort that I'm overall only 50 second. Um, if I get onto the top page, then I realize I've spent too much time on Stack Overflow. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm quite, quite happy with that, that position. Okay. So that's, that's actually the best way to get questions. So some people ask me questions directly, and the reality is they're not necessarily the ones I'm the best person to answer. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, definitely the best way to go is via Stack Overflow, I think. All right, cool. Thanks very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the JavaLine conference. Thank you. It's great.